Good evening and welcome back. This is World Talks and we continue on the topic of Ukraine. So Ukraine orders nationwide energy rationing after a massive Russian attack with more than 200 missiles and drones. To discuss the situation in the country, I am joined here right now by Stephen Moore, founder of Ukraine Freedom Project. Good evening, sir. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Sally. Great to be with you. So let me start, however, with this, la this latest political development, because uh, President Biden has uh, approved the use of uh, long-range weapons, at least in the Kursk region, uh, from what we gathered as far, because there are different reports. Uh, so what, is, what, are what are the reactions in Kyiv? Do we know what Zelensky thinks about it? Uh, you know, well, listen, people here in Ukraine are thrilled about it. My my signal channel's been lighting up. Everybody's talking about it. And But, you know, then you read a little bit deeper past the headlines, and it says, only Kursk region. And, you know, I was in Kivari uh, last week, and I attended the funeral of an entire family that had been killed by a Russian missile, except for the father. And uh, And it was just devastating to see this uh, tiny little infant casket um, being carried down the road. And unfortunately, this half measure on the way out the door does not do anything to help civilians or does very little to help civilians that are being hit by by uh, drones and by missiles. So, uh, you know, it's great to have it. It's great. Maybe, you know, maybe the Ukrainians can push back, take more of Kursk now uh, and have something more to bargain with should President Trump uh, want to have a peace agreement. But, you know, it's a little bit hard to get super excited about a half measure going out the door. Right, you've mentioned uh, Krivirik. However, you're based in, in Kyiv, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So could you please uh, give us an account of, of what actually unfolded last night? How was it from your point of view? Uh, how did... Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, um, I am pretty accustomed to drones and missiles, uh, but um, there was a lot of fireworks last night. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I live downtown. Uh, I have a good view um, so I can see everything that's going on and, uh, and, and it's reached a new height. And I think that Putin is testing Trump. He's, uh, seeing how far he can go. I think he's trying to, uh, take as much out of the Ukrainian people before Trump comes into, uh, into office. And, uh, and so, so, you know, he's stepping up his game and, you know, what, what needs to happen is there needs to be serious consequences for this. Uh, you know, Dan Rice, uh, who is the president of the American university in Kiev is a former military officer. He's advocating the use of, um, of cruise missiles, uh, and, you know, 1500 mile range, and they won't be used inside Russia unless they fire missiles and drones and at, 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 at civilians. And I think that's, I mean, that's the sort of measures that need to be taken to really uh, have, a, have a solid response to this. Right, but following the, this, this massive attack last night, Ukraine ordered a nationwide rationing of energy. So how will that look like? Yeah, you know, Ukrainians are accustomed to rationing energy. Um, you know, it's 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 nothing new. Uh, you know, it, it's always inconvenient. But you know, I I remember um, a year and a half ago, I was driving back from Warsaw back to Kiev, and I drove into Kiev, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was like, something weird's happening. Something, you know, something's different. And then I realized there were streetlights on. Because, uh, you know, for, for, for months and months and months, there'd been, you know, rationed electricity and then the streetlights came back on. So this is, you know, a drag, but it's nothing new for the Ukrainian people. Right, but not everyone has a power generator, so it must be must be quite uh, frustrating. Uh, but another an, another thing I wanted to um, talk to you about regarding this uh, recent attack. Some are saying that it is a response to Chancellor Scholz's phone call uh, with Vladimir Putin that he had on Friday, and that Vladimir Putin wanted to demonstrate his strength. Do you agree with this? Is that something that Ukrainians uh, agree with? Yeah, I think that what Putin's seeing is mixed signals from the European coalition. He's seeing a transition of power in America. And, you know, the guy has a you know, guy sniffs this stuff out. The guy has a nose for power vacuums, right? So so he sees a power vacuum. He sees an opportunity to uh, do inflict as much damage as possible uh, at a time whenever our European partners are, are sending mixed signals and, and the U.S. Uh, president's in transition. But at the same time, I mean, if you think about this, right, it only exacerbates the situation. I mean, there was some talk about negotiations, of course, with Trump coming into office in January. 
But then, you know, Putin goes in and does, does something like this. It seems, it seems to be a, a major setback. Oh, Sally, there is no chance that Putin is going to keep any peace agreement that he gets involved with. Uh, he's already in violation of hundreds of peace agreements, ceasefires, international treaties, international agreements of all types with dozens of countries, including yours and mine. And uh, so, you know, what's going to happen here is that if there's a peace negotiation, at some point, Putin is going to break it. And he's going to be emboldened because we started out this war with Ukraine fighting one nuclear power, Russia. And due to the Biden administration's feckless foreign policy, we are now fighting three nuclear powers with Iran and North Korea into it. So world events are going to conspire. This is what I think what the what the Trump administration is going to find. This is not like Afghanistan. This is not like some place that, you know, that you can just abandon. And uh, and and so they're going to find that that this is inextricably linked to all the powers that are working against us, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. And I, I think that the world events are going to limit the set of options that the Trump administration has going forward. Right. But there has been much talk about Trump administration, the upcoming administration, and some of the choices that Trump has made. Uh, we've, we've just discussed uh, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, and who has been called by Hillary Clinton a Russian asset. I wonder, what is the narrative in Ukraine? I mean, do people follow? Uh, who will Trump appoint to do what? I mean, is this a topic in Ukraine? Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> the Ukrainians are probably better educated on U.S. politics than many Americans. And uh, I am, you know, I, I used to work in Congress. I was the chief of staff to a member of House leadership for about seven years. And uh, so I am everyone's suggestion box to the U.S. government. And uh, and so I, I, I hear a lot. And, uh, you know, so so, yeah, everybody's worried about Tulsi Gabbard. Um, you know, she is uh, not someone that... I would trust with our nation's secrets. Um, all that, that being said, you know, Hillary Clinton is not the best messenger for that message. And uh, so, um, so, you know, and, and the other thing I found surprising is that on election day, you know, people were uncertain about a Trump, a Trump administration, but they knew Jake Sullivan by name and they were toasting his departure, you know? So, you know, Jake Sullivan is the guy that has, you know, kept them from using American weapons inside Russia. He's, you know, asked the Zelensky administration not to bomb uh, Russian refineries due, during their their uh, election campaign for fear of higher gas prices. Uh, you know, he's the guy that's been slow walking weapons to Ukraine. So it's been, uh, you know, they're very up to speed on U.S. politics, and I've never seen anyone toast the departure of a national security advisor. Right, uh, certainly there will be change ahead. We'll just have to see what kind of change uh, this will be. But we've hinted, hinted at weapons, right? I mean, weapons delivery, this is a major issue. Uh, I mean, uh, Biden has uh, made this step today. However, it seems that the deliveries of weapons that are already promised are still stuck. What is happening on that front? Yeah, that's really disappointing. I just got back from uh, Donetsk Oblast, where, uh, you know, I, I talked to a lot of people at the front, and, you know, they're finally seeing the delivery of U.S. weapons. So, you know, it took Congress six months to get the weapons appropriated, and then it took the Biden administration another six or seven months to actually get them to Ukraine. So the good news is if Trump decides to cut off U.S. weapons to Ukraine, the Ukrainians are accustomed to fighting without U.S. weapons. And, uh, you know, and, and this whole war, they've been just fighting with one hand behind their back. And, and I'd just like to see someone take off, you know, let the Ukrainians take off the gloves. And, uh, and so when they, when they have the weapons they need to fight, they succeed. They take land. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, they've taken out 700,000 Russian troops. And this is, with, you know, with, 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 with weapons being slowly delivered and, and restriction placed on them. Right, and sort of uh, we, we had these reports of uh, North Korean troops uh, fighting uh, for Russia now. My question is about Russia. How much longer can Russia fight? Because we can see shortage of, uh, of people, we can see shortage of weapons as well. So, so what is the time frame? Well, Sally, the heir to the Soviet military empire is getting weapons from Iran and troops from North Korea. And I think what you're seeing is that, you know, the, the, to get people to fight in Ukraine, the Russians are having to pay exorbitant prices. For instance, a soldier incoming into the military to fight in Ukraine is getting paid double what an entry-level soldier in the United States is getting. 
this is not sustainable. You know, the problem is, too, is that, you know, Russia is spending more than 10 percent of its gross domestic product on the war. Now, you know, look around your house and I encourage all your viewers, look around your house. You know, look at the bottom of your stuff and see which of it says made in Russia, because it's not made in Russia. There is nothing made in Russia. Russia digs things out of the ground like gold and oil and gas, and they make weapons. And right now they're making a ton of weapons. So so if there's a peace agreement, Putin's not going to go, you know, retool his economy to make refrigerators because they don't make refrigerators. They make weapons. So what he's going to do is stockpile weapons, and there's going to be another problem shortly down the road. Right. Uh, so Russia is uh, indeed manufacturing more as it has turned to, to, to the war economy. That's what you're saying, I believe. But uh, also Ukraine has started producing some weapons domestically. We're nearing uh, 1,000 days of this war. And I believe that Ukrainians are also trying to become more self-sufficient. So what do we know about uh, what, what Ukraine is doing domestically? Well, you know, the ingenuity and the creativity and the perseverance of the Ukrainians is just inspiring. And let me tell you why. Um, again, you know, they were without 155 millimeter artillery shells for some number of months. So what did they do? They ramped up the production of kamikaze drones and they've made... I don't know, something like a million and a half drones, two million drones. And these drones, these kamikaze drones, are taking up the, the, the mission space of what artillery used to do. And Chassav Yar, which is the place where the front is now, where Zero Line is now, 90% of the uh, combat casualties are from drones. So this is a drone war. And the message I want to give to, to Europe and the United States is that that our armies are not prepared for the sort of ground war that's happening here in Ukraine. We're not prepared for drones. We don't have good drones. And the Ukrainians are making some of the best, most innovative, most deadly drones in the world. And we're fortunate to have them as partners so we can take advantage of that. Right. And next week, this uh, meeting of uh, European leaders is taking place in Warsaw. And I was wondering, what kind of message would Ukraine like to hear? What kind of promises? What is there to, to still deliver uh, what is on the, uh, on the Ukraine's wish list? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think um, from America, just getting the weapons that Congress appropriated would be a big step. Uh, I think they're going to want to see uh, additional long range weapons so they can take the fight to the Russians. I think they're going to want to see. Um, and I think actually the most important thing is not necessarily what Ukraine wants, but what this group can signal to the Trump administration. And the, the, the great signal would be is that we're all getting up to more than 2% of our GDP in, in uh, defense, right? Because there's a lot of folks in Europe that are slacking. And uh, that's been a main, one of Trump's biggest problems. So I think uh, signaling to Trump that, you, that Europe's actually in the war and the Germans and the French actually care about the Russians uh, knocking on their doorstep, uh, I think that's going to be important. If you want to maintain a partnership with Trump, you got to show them you got some skin in the game. And that, that Warsaw Conference is a good place to do that. And on this note, we're going to conclude. Stephen Moore, thank you so much for being with us. Much appreciated. Thank you. Sally, great to see you. Love being with you. Thanks. And thank you for watching World Talks. Please stay tuned for more here on TVP World. News Bulletin coming right up.